Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming to On Course with Liberal Arts. Today's topic is reflecting on the pandemic from an historian's perspective. It is my honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Philippa Levine. Dr. Levine is an historian of the British Empire, gender, race, science, and technology. She studied history at King's College in Cambridge and then completed a doctorate at St. Anthony's College in Oxford. Levine was elected a Fellow of the Royal Historical Society and a Fellow of the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland. Dr. Levine has spent most of her career in the United States and currently directs the British Studies Program in the History Department here at UT Austin in the College of Liberal Arts. She has held both the Mary Helen Thompson Centennial Professorship in the Humanities and the Walter Prescott Webb Professorship in History and Ideas. Please send your questions via the chat function and we will answer as many as possible in the last half of the webinar. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thanks so much, Angie. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, I'm coming to you actually from Britain uh, at the moment. I'm on leave this year and back at Oxford where I did my doctorate. Um, so I'm thinking about the pandemic both in terms of um, the US and the UK, but also globally as well. So it's been an interesting, depressing for, uh, as, as for all of us, but an interesting few months for someone who works in history of medicine and science to think about this. And I want to start by saying that for anyone who works in the history of medicine and science, we always knew in a way that something like this was coming. We couldn't know, except in the vaguest terms, what it would be, when it would happen, how it would occur, and where it would occur, but we always knew that this was coming because pandemics and epidemics are part of, they're a fact of life on this planet. And the problem really, it seems to me, is we weren't as prepared for it as we could have been. And there are a number of reasons for that. In the first place, a lot of epidemiologists have talked about this. We had assumed, all of us, uh, historians, epidemiologists, public health people, the basic assumption had been that when the next epidemic hit, as we knew it would, that it would almost certainly be an influenza-based epidemic. And most of the preparation that was done, insofar as it was done, was for something that looks uh, like an H1N1 or any other kind of influenza. No one was actually thinking that what we were gonna see was a SARS-based problem, a COVID problem, which of course is what we've got. So that, I think has made it more difficult than it needed to be because we simply weren't prepared for the kind of epidemic that we got. Secondly, and this is something that is not unique, I think, to either this epidemic or to epidemics in general, and that is that for governments and for politicians and for states, there's always this temptation to cut costs when things are not urgent. And because we haven't had an epidemic, or at least a major epidemic, and not in the West for some time, the temptations to cut costs on epidemiology, on public health, on preparedness for an epidemic, had also kind of taken over. And we see that in a number of different developed countries where the truth is we could have been more prepared and we weren't. So these are what some of the reasons why things have been, I think, as serious as they have been over the last few months. And certainly they have been. We'll come to that in a moment. Just a quick uh, note on why this is a pandemic and not an epidemic. I know this question I get asked quite a lot by people. Things that are epidemic are when you, you know, when you have a disease that is kind of flowing through a population pretty fast. But why this one is a pandemic and not an epidemic, what makes that difference is the geographical breadth. This is a seriously global epidemic and a very high rate of infection and little or no immunity. When you put those three things together, you kind of shift from what we would have called an epidemic to a pandemic. Now, being a historian, of course, what I'm interested in it, to some extent is how does it rack up versus earlier previous experiences of these kinds of, of, of issues in the past? I'm going to start that section with a little quote from The Lancet, which is one of the major medical journals even to this day in Britain, founded in the 19th century. And in 1853, at the time of the third cholera epidemic in Europe, so something that was already known as an epidemic, uh, there had been epidemics since the 1830s of cholera sweeping through Europe and killing people in a very nasty, very painful fashion. But somebody wrote, a doctor wrote in The Lancet in 1853, that we know nothing. We are at sea in a whirlpool of conjecture. And in some ways, it seems to me that we've spent the last few months, even with the kinds of technologies that we now have, reliving that experience in some kinds of ways. So things are not that different than they necessarily were 100 years ago, 150 years ago, or even earlier. 
Now, the first of the global flu epidemics, and those are the ones that, are, that I'm going to concentrate on because they're the ones that are relatively close to, to what we're looking at, and they're also the modern ones. The first global flu epidemic was in 1889, and it originated in Russia and spread from Russia rapidly, and it spread across the world. We find it, um, examples of it throughout Europe, in South Africa, in Hong Kong, in Samoa. So it really was one of these incredibly global um, epidemics in those ways. And a very similar pattern in some ways to what we've seen with COVID um, in 2020, starting out in big cities, moving from big cities into smaller cities and from there spreading to the countryside. So we see some very similar patterns in terms of the, the way that these, these epidemics actually kind of move through and grow through populations in these kinds of ways these kinds of ways. I should say, by the way, that this influenza epidemic at the end of 1889 uh, was the first major epidemic outbreak since cholera in the 1840s and 1850s. Um, and, uh, and outbreaks of it, I'm sorry to tell you, was still being recorded in 1895. So this was an epidemic that lasted for five, five or six years. That's a depressing thought. We probably will get through that in less time than five or six years, but it's worth knowing that these things can drag on. This particular epidemic in the 1890s, 1889 to the 90s, um, resulted in about a million deaths. And interestingly, some epidemiologists are now speculating that in fact it wasn't a flu epidemic, that it might actually have been an early coronavirus epidemic rather than a flu, but nobody really knows. So of course, that's the, that's the first of these, of these famous ones, but the really famous flu epidemic comes, of course, in 1919-1920, and this was incredibly devastating. It was on really on a par with the First World War, but of course it came immediately after the war. When you put these two things together, the, the amount of death, the, just the, the, the rate of, of mortality is just shocking. The 1919-1920 flu epidemic caused about 50 million deaths, five zero, 50 million deaths. Um, like the current um, COVID uh, panic, uh, there was an untried cure that people were pushing in the early days of the vaccine. It, in this case, it was aspirin. It uh, increased mortality quite significantly because it was aspirin doesn't do anything for influenza and in many cases it did actually cause deaths that didn't need to be happened. Um, there was of course also a series of um, protests against uh, different kinds of physical restrictions on people and also against mask wearing so we see some very similar things happening as we see today in those kinds of uh, in those kinds of ways. Um, it's also a time of heavy increase in mass global travel partly because travel had become cheaper and easier and faster than it had ever been before, but also because soldiers were across the world, right? We have a Western Front and an Eastern Front in the First World War, so you've got a lot of people who otherwise might not have been traveling, traveling, and what we know about epidemics is that they are increased by increased human travel. And of course, this epidemic was also made much worse by the fact that at the end of the First World War, you did have weakened immunity in lots of populations. Weakened immunity because people were not eating as well. Weakened immunity because people were coming back with, um, with uh, injuries and other kinds of things from the war. So we know that the 50 million deaths is partly about this coming on the back of an also devastating war. But those are the sort of two um, epidemics that we tend to look at as this kind of historical antecedents to what we're facing and experiencing right now in, in 2020. So what are the modern numbers? Uh, my numbers are as of yesterday, so they could have changed a little bit, but this is what numbers look like in the COVID virus today. Something like, and these are all obviously very rough figures. We know that uh, that reporting isn't perfect everywhere. Um, it lags a little bit. Some things get reported that probably shouldn't be. Other cases don't get reported, they're not known about. So take it all with a little bit of, of, of skepticism. But basically what we're looking at is something like 67 million confirmed cases cases of COVID and just over one and a half million deaths. So nothing like what we saw in the first world uh, in 1919, 1920, but still a pretty serious mortality rate of about 1.5 million. In the US, we're looking at about 15 million confirmed cases and 285,000 and rising deaths. In Texas specifically, about one and a half million cases, just under one and a half million cases, and 23,000 deaths. So still very significant numbers. 
In the UK, where I am, and where we've just come out of a month of lockdown, we're looking at about 1.7 million cases overall, much smaller population, obviously, than the US, and about 61,000 deaths. There are places where the death rate, the deaths are literally under 100. Uh, Justin and I were just talking about Australia and New Zealand before we began, and they've done an interesting and different kind of, of, of um, outreach there that has succeeded in keeping their death rate very, very small. Worst affected by deaths as a proportion of the population is Mexico, and I mention that because, of course, Texas shares a border with Mexico, so it matters, I think, um, in the Texas context in a way that it might not matter um, for people elsewhere, although it certainly matters, obviously, to Mexicans. And in a place like Bulgaria in Eastern Europe, one in 1,000 people are currently hospitalized with COVID. So this is a very serious epidemic. It's not a hoax. It's not something that we can afford to be complacent about, um, and it's not something that is minor. Certainly, there are people who've yet to meet someone who has, 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 has suffered from COVID. My family has lost three people, so I think that's probably more common. Um, but it is something that I think we need to take very, very seriously. But why? Why is this happening? What has produced this disaster, this, this clear disaster that we're looking at? Um, all sorts of things. Uh, and just as I talked about the impact of the First World War uh, on, on the, the flu epidemic of 1919, 1920, there are very specific issues that really show us something about what is happening today. And that I think if we take a longer term view, which is what historians do, we can kind of see the build up to this happening over time. I want to stress, first of all, the impact of environmental and climatic change. And here I want to share my screen for a moment and show you a really very interesting, ah, uh, here it is, right there. Um, I'm hoping you can share. Can you see that? I think you can. This is a very interesting um, graphic of um, pandemics throughout history. And what is particularly interesting to me about it, and, what, and you can sort of see the size of the different, obviously the different epidemics, and you can see how big certain ones are compared with other ones. But what's really significant to me as a historian is to look at how uh, further back you go, the more spread, th spread out those, those epidemics are. But when you get closer to the modern period, what you're seeing is a real cluster. So you can see there that in the sort of post- um, Russian and Spanish flu, uh, and remember, Spanish flu is a name we really shouldn't use. It's got nothing to do with Spain. Um, but at any rate, that, that, that influencer of the early 20th century, if you look at the late 20th and early 21st century, how much closer together these clusters of epidemics are, epid epidemics and pandemics are. Some of them, of course, were brought under control very quickly, but many of them weren't. And you can see the numbers are really quite significant. I want to suggest to you, and this is what both epidemiologists and public health people on the one hand and historians and environmentalists are talking about, is that this... Um, the prediction is that pandemics will be more frequent and will spread more rapidly. And this, I think, this shows us this in quite an interesting way because of what's happening with climatic change and with environmental, the impact of humans on the environment and on what we're doing. And I want to point to a number of things that have longish, 100-year kinds of histories, 100 to 150-year histories, and are related particularly to uh, questions around industrialization. The first is the rise in what we call zoonotic diseases, that is diseases that transmit from animals to humans. And that's something that has grown over time as we uh, destroy more wildlife habitats in order to create factories and farms and housing and roads and other kinds of human habitats, um, which replace wildlife habitats. Um, as agriculture intensifies and as land use changes. All of those things are, we know, because people have been tracking this for a long time, biologists, veterinarians, that that rise in zoonotic diseases, that transmission from humans, uh, from, I'm sorry, from animals to humans, is what's causing it. If you look again at those epidemics from the most recent period, almost all of those have been 
um, from zoonotic diseases, obviously not HIV AIDS, or actually even HIV AIDS with the simian connection. But you know, it's very much like those where we saw um, rats coming off ships in the 14th century and those kinds of things. But that rise, very, very, very significant. A second factor, and related to that, is the high intensity, the high density and high intensity factory farming um, that is implicated in the modern food system and the modern food chain. And that's something, again, that historians have sort of spent quite a lot of time tracking over time. It's a relatively modern um, experience. In the 19th century, uh, we begin to see the industrialization of foodstuffs, uh, the, pro you know, the production of things like dried milk powders, and um, mass production of things like, uh, in, in the beginning, canned products and so on and so on. And that, that shift, particularly into farming, and particularly into factory farming of animals, again, is something that has produced uh, SARS and other epidemics which have really originated in intensive industrial meat production. And what those farms do, and this is quite important, again, for understanding how these epidemics and pandemics spread, is that the way that, that, um, that these, uh, these farmed animals are, are, are being kind of created is that they're becoming a genetically uniform population of the animals who we, that, which, that we use for meat. And if you have a genetically um, uniform population, what you also have is a much greater susceptibility to disease because they're all, uh, every animal is susceptible to the disease. Whereas in a population that hasn't been genetically engineered in those kinds of ways, you're going to get some folks, and it must be the same for humans, some who will be more and some who will be less susceptible to a disease, and that's going to kind of help even things out. So the, the genetic uniformity of these animal populations who are feeding humans is definitely something that makes them more susceptible to disease. And because of that, there is, of course, an increasing reliance on pharmaceuticals, which has an effect on, immune, on the immune system of both the animals and on humans. But that increased uh, reliance on pharmaceuticals also, of course, means that we are we're kind of moving towards a much more industrial system. So that's a real set of problems uh, around zoonotic diseases and their relationship to the kind of intensive farming that is a result of the Industrial Revolution and its effects on the Western food system and the West, Western food chain. Obviously, I mentioned, and this was the case in the First World War, but obviously it's in a fact it exponentially increased, and that is global travel. The more we travel, the more we move around, the more we move things around with us, whether it's uh, you know stuff that lives on rats or whether it's stuff that, that gets into our lungs. But global travel, and I'm guilty. I mean, here I am in a you know in a foreign country for the year, um, but we move around much more, and that again is going to mean that we spread diseases um, as we go. Another interesting, and I hadn't thought about this until I started reading up on this, but I've been reading about this in the last few days, is that there is a real sense that COVID is also exacerbated by air pollution. What some of the studies are showing is that we're seeing higher case numbers of COVID where fine particle pollution is high. There's been a real tracking of that. So again, the things that we're pushing out into the air environmentally are almost certainly exacerbating the seriousness, the gravity of the cases of COVID that we're seeing. Um, so there are many reasons why we're seeing COVID occur um, and, and move so fast through populations. And a lot of it has to do with environmental and um, climate change. What that means, and for historians, this is really important, is that this is not simply a biological phenomenon, but something that is social and cultural as well. It's tied, if you like, to human behaviors. Um, and decisions. And that's really important, right? We've made choices about the kind of food system we have. We also make choices both individually and collectively about travel, about, um, about what kind of, uh, of, of consumer society we want to live in. And these things have an impact on the environment, but also therefore on our health, just as the foods that we choose to eat might have an impact on our health in terms of obesity, in terms of heart disease, all these other kinds of things. So an epidemic or a pandemic, any kind of disease, is as much a social and a cultural phenomenon as it is um, a biological one. And that means that we need to explain it and understand it, not just through the science, although the science is obviously paramount, but also through understanding our responsibilities, if you like, and our decisions um, as humans, both collectively and um, 
uh, and uh, individually. So I want to go to my second slide here. Uh, there we go. Right. And then I'm going to get rid of my slides because there's just, just two of them. So it does seem to me that one of the interesting things that we need to think about is how our choices as human beings, how these social and cultural practices that drive epidemic and pandemic diseases um, have extraordinary implications for, as you can see from this chart, for inequality of various kinds of things. Racial disparity has been one of the most interesting things that the pandemic has actually shown us. And here you can see the radical difference in different groups uh, who are being affected by COVID. Um, and this is, yeah, this, this is deaths through from COVID, sorry, per 100,000 people by race or ethnicity. And what we see here is how much higher the rate of, uh, of, of infection and death is in the case of certain groups within the United States than in other groups. So the very lowest are amongst Asian Americans, white Americans, and Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Americans. But Black Americans, African Americans, uh, Native Americans, and uh, Latino Americans, Latino, Latinx peoples are affected, as you can see, at a much, much higher rate. That isn't just, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, stop sharing my screen now because those are the only two slides that I have. So let me just persuade my mm, persuade my mouse that it wants to go over there. And there we go. That's better. Lovely. Um, so these kinds of racial disparities that we see in in the U.S. are mirrored in other Western countries too. Um, that, that that certain groups are dying at a much higher rate than their proportion in the population. It isn't just a racial disparity. We're seeing those living in poverty being um, proportionately di effect, disproportionately affected. And there are a number of reasons for this. A lot of it has to do um, with housing. Um, that, and, and this is interesting, again, historically, if you can't segregate because the housing that you live in is too small, then the chances of everybody in your household becoming infected, getting, getting the disease, obviously, is something that is much greater, uh, much more dangerous. And so people living in inadequate housing, smaller houses, people who don't have gardens, um, who don't have yards, are obviously in a much different place. And it's interesting because if we go back to another epidemic from the early 20th century, there was a nasty outbreak of polio in New York in 1916. And in that, um, in that epidemic, uh, which killed about 2,300 kids, about 2,300 kids overall, what happened was that children, that the, 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 the local public health authorities in New York, took children away forcibly from their parents in order to break the, the infection cycle, unless the parents were able to guarantee that they could segregate the children into separate room, a separate room from the rest of the household and pay for the medical care. Well, obviously, those who had large houses, those who were wealthy, those who could afford to do that, were able to keep their children at home. And that what that meant was it was poor people who essentially were unable, were unable to do that and had their children taken away from them. So we can see in this earlier epidemic the way that the kind of relationship between things like housing and wealth make a difference to how you experience um, these kinds of things. Obviously, particularly in, in, in a place like the United States with a private healthcare system, access to health healthcare and access uh, and health inequities um, are, are something that uh, that are quite important in 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 determining how safe uh, you are going to be during COVID. Uh, a little private, a little personal story. A friend of mine who got tested um, in Nashville um, a few weeks ago for COVID and got a bill for two thousand three hundred dollars um, and is still fighting about the last five hundred dollars of it with the insurance company. Many people simply can't afford, uh, you know, she'll probably end up paying the 500 if she has to, but many people can't afford to do that. So they might make the choice not to, to get tested, not to look for treatment, all of those kinds of things. Um, some of the solutions that also have, um, that we've turned to, to try and deal with life going on during the epidemic also have some quite problematic um, results for certain, for certain groups of the population. It's not the case now that, that, that winter is, is, is coming in, but during the summer and autumn months in many countries, a lot, and this was the case in a place like New York, in a place like Paris, in a place like London, 
um, restaurateurs and cafe owners would start to put all of their tables out onto the sidewalks or pavements, as we would call them in England. Uh, what that meant was you had to kind of walk around uh, around them, but that way they were able to keep people further apart and actually keep up their business. A one level, great idea, but the impact on disabled people, the mobility of disabled people who were unable to essentially get around um, these kinds of places was something that kind of, you know, because it was taking up outdoor street space, um, it really did have an effect on the mobility of the physically disabled. So that's been one kind of um, unforeseen side effect that our trying to cope with these kinds of things has had on on a section, a minority of the population, but a minority who also, um, you know, uh, have as much right to, to the to the streets as, as as the rest of us. Another thing that you, I'm sure you have all noticed, I've certainly noticed here a lot, is the kind of pollution problem, the litter problem that is arising from um, our attempts to cope with this. Uh, we see masks, fallen masks. All, you know, all over the streets and the gardens and the parks here in England as we go walking, and walking has become our main activity, of course, because we can't socialise um, in, the, in the system that we have here. And so we're seeing discarded masks um, creating a kind of new form of pollution um, as we go. So these are interesting kinds of um, unforeseen consequences of what's going on today. The other thing that I think is happening, and again, there's a historical precedent for this, is that it is producing, and I mentioned the border between Mexico and Texas earlier, because I do think it's important, but what we're seeing, I think, and we will see more of, is a fear of immigrants as people who will move disease around, who will bring disease with them. And this is not something that is unique to the United States or unique to the Texas-Mexico border by any means. In, in the UK, in 1919, uh, the Aliens Restriction Act began to do what the Americans had been doing uh, at this point for probably about uh, about 20 years, which was introducing medical inspection of those who hoped to, um, to, 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 to settle in the UK, just as, as those coming to Ellis Island hoped to settle in the US. And it's interesting because in that 1916 polio outbreak in New York that I just mentioned, it was Italian immigrants who were blamed quite wrongly, but they were blamed for the spread of the disease during that time. We've also seen a lot of times in which anti-Semitism has grown up in these periods. So um, going back to the 14th century, Jews were blamed um, in some cases for the, 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 the Black Death, which of course was a devastating um, um, uh, epidemic in the 14th century. And in the 20th century, they've been blamed in Germany, not surprisingly, but also in Turkey for outbreaks of typhus. Uh, so we see um, immigrants and um, minority people often being blamed for um, the spread of disease and particularly the spread of these kinds of pandemics. That brings us in a sense to a question that I think um, has been raised by a number of different people in a number of different ways and I want to frame it as are some lives worth more than other lives. I'm thinking specifically of some of the comments that were made by conservative commentators in the United States, Dan Patrick in, in Texas, Chris Christie in New Jersey, the um, broadcaster Glenn Beck, um, all of whom have said uh, in order to get the economy back on its feet, we should essentially accept that we will lose a proportion of the population, and particularly the older population, Dan Patrick, you know, offered to, to, to sort of be a guinea pig in those kinds of ways. But for me, as a historian, when I hear that being said, it reminds me of a book that came out in 1920, which became one of the most important books of the Nazi period um, when the Nazis came to power in the 1930s. It's a book by two, a lawyer and a psychiatrist, two men called Hocher and Binding, and the book was called, um, it essentially it, it was, you know, Some Lives are worth, are worth More Than Others. Their book, basically arguing that, that some lives were more, worth more than others, and it was worth thinking about um, sort of state-assisted suicide for people who were expensive for the state to maintain, became Nazi policy in 1933. Um, and in, indeed, even before that, because during the First World War, when food began to run out, um, psychiatric prisoners, uh, I'm sorry, psychiatric patients, rather, we'll come to prisoners in a moment, psychiatric patients were basically starved in order to free up foodstuffs for the uh, soldiers in the First World War, and about 30% of those uh, of those patients died as a result. That became a standard policy 
under, under Nazism, under Hitler, with the, what was called the Action T4 regime in the, in the early 1930s. It went through to 1940-41, um, when it quietly became something that went on in the concentration camps, whereby people who were considered to be disabled, whether it was mentally or physically, were essentially not just left to die, as they had been in the First World War, but actively killed. Um, and this was kind of the, the, the run-up to the gas chambers. This was where, where they kind of practiced how to do that. Obviously, that's not what Beck and Christie and, 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 and Patrick are arguing for. But in arguing that some people should be willing to give up their lives to keep the economy alive, there's a false dichotomy there. Uh, and one that I think is dangerously close to allowing the state to choose who should live and who should die. Um, and it is a false dichotomy because think about it. If there's no people for the economy, then the economy doesn't really matter. If you don't have living, breathing people to supply, to buy, to make, you know, if you don't have demand and supply, then you can have an economy, but it's not going anywhere. And so the false dichotomy between choosing between people and, uh, and the economy just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So I think it's a very dangerous set of arguments, but it has its precedent, um, again, in, uh, in early 20th century phenomena that historians tend to study. So finally, that brings me to vaccine and quarantine, also things that historians have spent a long time, uh, a, a long time um, thinking about. Quarantine, first of all, the term. Quarantine, if you think about, if you know any French, you'll know that it comes from the word quarante, and quarante means 40, because quarantines, and this is where we can be happy that we only have to do 14 days quarantine. I had to do 14 days when I got to Britain. It used to be 40 days quarantine. If you moved around, particularly the Mediterranean, which was the kind of most famous and the earliest system of quarantine in kind of early modern and um, in early modern Europe, it's known as the Venetian system, um, you had to do 40 days. And this was a widespread um, uh, phenomenon that you had to do. And again, we, it's very interesting. We see a difference between the rich and the poor. The rich could take apartments uh, in these places and, and live quite nicely and have food brought into them. The poor tended to put up tents in the, in, in the sort of inside the walls of the quarantine stations, what were called the lazaretti, uh, because it's all they could afford. They couldn't afford to rent rooms in there. So we see again that disparity between the rich and the poor, even in early quarantine. Quarantine was widespread in the 18th century um, and in fact didn't go away. In 1832, Australia introduced its first quarantine act um, uh, to, to make sure that it had, uh, make sure it could keep, could keep disease out. The first national quarantine act in United States came um, in the 1890s uh, and that was as a result of yellow fever so we know that all of that was happening in those times. Were there protests? Absolutely. Many protests against quarantine, uh, protests against masking were very very common in this period um, so we know that all of that was going on. And I want to talk a little bit also about the Great Barrington Declaration. Some of you will have heard of this in um, should have mentioned this earlier, I'm sorry, um, that, was, that, that was signed in October 2020 by a number of, um, of, of scientists who were opposed to quarantine and opposed to essentially lockdown kinds of regulations. What they argued was that we should, um, in, in the fashion that really that that, that Dan Patrick and people were suggesting that we should have wider exposure of people to the virus because wider exposure would raise immunity. Um, so the idea was you would isolate the vulnerable and keep, let everyone else live free. It's a form of what was called herd immunity. And herd immunity technically is the point at which the rate of new infections is stable, isn't rising anymore. That's what essentially herd immunity means. Um, however, it's something that, uh, that even if it gets you out of quarantine, it, we're, we're fairly sure that in fact it doesn't work. The Great Barrington, there's been an enormous amount of critique of it. Um, one, Madison, one demographer at the University of Wisconsin at Madison has said that the plan will only work if three out of every five Americans decide they should get a disease that can kill them for the sake of the greater good. So, you know, hands up, which of the three of us wants to do that? Um, so, there are problems 
with with this idea of herd immunity. On the one hand, it's an undue burden on on the vulnerable, um, and then, uh, and it also there are problems with how you identify them. It's very hard to know exactly who's vulnerable. You have to know a lot about people. It isn't just about age. It's about underlying conditions. It's about immunity. Um, what kind of an immune system you have. So it's very difficult to actually identify who is vulnerable, which means you could be putting people at risk because you don't know they're vulnerable. And it's very difficult to get people essentially to quarantine, right? Which is what you want people to do. You want the, the, the vulnerable essentially to quarantine in order to try and save them while you put everybody else out there to get the disease as it were. Um, secondly, we know that the length of post-infection immunity is unclear. We don't know how much immunity you have um, once you've had COVID. Uh, there's some sense that actually it doesn't last very long, the immunity, and that we, you, know, it, you, you could get the, the, the disease a second time. If that's the case, then the Great Barrington Declaration cannot work, right? It just isn't possible for it to work since you, you know, two, three months later, you might get sick again. Um, so the, the, the um, what was I going to say? Help, help, herd immunity kind of works. I mean, it's being used essentially as a, it is the successful protocol for flu. But the reason we can do it for flu and not for COVID is because we have um, retrovirals, right, that can deal with people if they do get flu, if they're part of that vulnerable population. We can't do that with COVID because we don't have any treatments yet, right? We're looking for a vaccine, we don't have any treatments for COVID yet. So there's no retrovirals that could save people if in fact they did get sick and looked as if they were gonna die. So it's a very different situation than we see within flu. So the parallel that people make um, in terms of herd immunity won't work. And that's what most epidemiologists are now saying. So vaccine is, of course, um, where we are now. Uh, they started vaccinating today in Britain, in fact. There were, paid, there were pictures in the paper this morning of the first, they're, they're, they're vaccinating, I think it's the over 80 year olds or the over 85 year olds. It was a lovely photograph of the first woman to get the, the vaccine this morning, a 90 year old woman. She looked fabulous for 19, I thought, uh, just fabulous. But she was the first person to get vaccinated this morning. And I think it's coming in the States in a fairly, in fairly short order. Um, so, the vaccine obviously is what we're all hoping for, but there are some problems. So the first thing is that, of course, as we all know, vac vaccine has been politicized in serious, serious ways. It's become something not just in the United States, but I think in many countries where um, politicians are kind of racing to have their country be the place where we you know which saves the world. Um, there's real pressure on pharmaceutical companies and on researchers to declare safety, even though in fact the average vaccine takes 10 to 15 years of research to come to market and we're doing this in a matter of months and there are concerns from some people that we may be doing it too quickly and we don't know we can't know obviously what the long-term effects of vaccines are going to be this is not by the way an anti-vax statement uh, i just want to say i'm signing up for the vaccine as soon as it becomes available um, but i think at the same time we need to be aware um, and as, a, and as a historian who's worked on some of this stuff, what we do know um, is that uh, there, there, there are ethical issues around vaccines, both in terms of who, uh, who, who the experimental subjects are, who the human guinea pigs are. In, 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 in prior years, we know that there's been some pretty unethical stuff going on in terms of who gets, who gets the vaccine and who doesn't, but also, um, we know how long it normally takes and, and what corners you might have to cut to to get there. Secondly, another problem with the vaccine is that unless we get a buy in from a large percentage of any population, it can't work. Right. And so that's a real problem. And, and the last poll that I looked at suggested that only about 60 percent of Americans had indicated that they would be either willing or probably willing to vaccinated at this point and that won't be enough so when we put together or, oh, oh and the third thing of course is that the, the the many of the of the vaccines that we're pinning our hopes on for covid are a very new kind of vaccine they're called rna vaccines they're not based on what we used to do which is the old killed virus um form of vaccine that's you know what we used to use for smallpox and, and all and polio and all of those kinds of things where you essentially take a, you take the virus and you inject a what's called killed virus so it's a virus that you've kind of rendered safe and clean but you inject it to give um the patient a 
a kind of very minor dose of the illness in, in order to produce immunity. That's not most of what the vaccine, the new vaccines for COVID are. The new vaccines for COVID are what we call RNA-based RNA vaccines, where you take a the genetic sequence of the coronavirus and use that instead. So the problem with that is we don't know what effect that will have on a large population nor a long nor long term because it's never been done before it's very exciting for scientists because they're now dealing with rna uh, vaccines in a way that they haven't been able to before but we cannot know and we will not know for a decade what the long-term implications are or what that's going to look like on a much larger population so when we put together the unknowns of a new virus the question of uptake and whether people will do it the history of the ethics of these kinds of trials and the disparity between the average 10 to 15 years to get a new vaccine to market and what we're doing now, obviously we have some issues to think about. So that of course means that it's a dilemma in many ways. Uh, there's no kind of obvious and easy path for any of us to take. So what are the takeaways from this? That's what I'm gonna end with. What do, what do the takeaways look like? Um, I would say, one, we need to know the historical record because we can learn from past errors. We could have done better. We could have been more prepared. We can be careful about the ways um, in which we put things on the market. We can think harder about the climatic and environmental issues that are exacerbating not just this virus, but those that are to come, because this is not going to be the last virus it will probably be the last virus of my lifetime because I'm older, but it won't be the last virus of the lifetimes of many, of many, many people, and certainly not our children and our grandchildren. So number one, I think we need the historical record. I think it's really important that historians and public health people and medical people talk to one another um, and learn from one another. Second, we need community buy-in and less political partisanship. We need people to be thinking about the common good and not just about themselves. And we need politicians to back off um, from the kind of politics of pride and to think about these communities and why communities matter in that sense. We need a commitment to maintain adequate public health spending. You know, we did, we, we got it wrong. We didn't spend enough money on public health spending, cut, governments cut back. We the population need to press our governments to make sure, I think, that the spending, the, the adequate kinds of public health spending are always going to be there when an epidemic breaks. We need to address the inequalities and inequities which are ravaging poorer and ill-served populations who are going down in much greater numbers both to the illness and uh, obviously in terms of mortality. We need to pay attention to the ecologies of damage that will intensify future pandemics, the factory farming and so forth and so on. We need to look at that. And finally, I think we need to be sensible and responsible until this particular pandemic ends. And I'll leave it at that. We have several questions ready for you. Um, the first is, has herd immunity ever been reached? Not with COVID, no. Um, I mean, we, we use it, we use it, it's, it's one of the flu protocols we, we use because we can, because we have backups, but no, her herd immunity has not been reached because the only, well, the only places that have actually tried her herd immunity um, formally in the COVID epidemic have been the Scandinavian countries and they backed off when they realised that it wasn't working and that their death rates were actually going up. So no, um, and we're not really in a position to be able to, to do it, which is why I think there's been such a strong reaction to the Great Barrington Declaration of October um, this year. Uh, it's, it's a great idea in principle, and that's what the scientists, the scientists who oppose it are saying. It's a great idea um, in principle, but it's not going to work when we don't have all of the kinds of protocols and knowledge in place that we have for diseases that we now know how to, 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 to manage in those ways. And think about it, even with flu, we're looking at something like 25,000 deaths a year from the, the influenza in a, in a country like the US, even with those protocols in place. Thank you. And follow-up question, has herd immunity ever been achieved for past diseases? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, it's a fairly modern concept, so we don't, I, I, I don't think we know about much earlier periods. We really only know about, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a pretty modern concept. Um, it's, it's a post-Second World War disease control. 
Um, and I think flu would be the, the only one I can think of off the top of my head is flu. And even there, as I said, it's not, it doesn't, it's not perfect. We're still, we're still looking at pretty serious mortality rates. Um, and it's the reason your doctor is always begging you to have a flu shot. Great. Um, next question. Do you have any thoughts on the reasons that polio and smallpox weren't larger epidemics? Do you know if the disease agents mutated to milder forms over time? Well, obviously, we, we, we can sometimes see mutations to milder forms over time, but I wouldn't have called smallpox small um, in terms of epidemic um, effects. If you look at the 19th century, the, the, the mortality rate from smallpox, actually, and earlier, is absolutely hideous. It's absolutely huge. And it's one of the reasons why we actually have um, the kind of vaccination protocols that we now have. Smallpox was one of the very earliest where we see um, people experimenting because it was such a devastating disease and so widespread and in so many countries. So what you get is you have um, um, sort of sort of two sets of it. There was what was called variolation, uh, where you literally did inject people with, with smallpox and then, of course, the inoculations that came after that. Um, and it's interesting, actually, because the, the, the origins of that start not in the West, and not with traditional scientists, but with a woman, a woman called Mary Wortley Montague, who herself had suffered from smallpox and did not want her children to. And she was she was the 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 wife of the British ambassador to Constantinople, the Ottoman Empire, in the 18th century. And she saw that they were using this technique where they would scrape a piece of skin on your on your arm and uh, and basically scrape um, smallpox into you, and you you'd have a mild dose of it, get a mild dose of it, and then you had immunity. She did it to her own children. It became very fashionable amongst the rich in Britain to do it. And then obviously, you know, it moved into the sciences. Everyone forgets about the fact that it was a woman and the, and the East who did it first, as opposed to, you know, the usual, the usual suspects. Um, but it became um, one of the commonest of the, of, the, of the vaccines by the end of the 19th century, which is why we think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's been so successful in that sense, but it was devastating. But it's also interesting to note that it was one of the big, um, one of the big early anti-vax sort of campaigns was around that. So in the 1860s, 1870s in Britain, uh, the government wanted to institute kind of mandatory um, vaccine programs to try and, and, and deal with the devastations of smallpox. It's a, it really is nasty. Um, and um, there was a huge outbreak of, of anti-vaccination um, campaigning and movements in that period. And it's interesting, it was mostly a working class um, movement. It wasn't, it wasn't the sort of middle class anti-vax movement that we see today. It was working class folks who had a notion that their children were having the lymph taken out of their lymph fluid taken out of their um, lymph nodes, which was being given to rich children to keep them keep them safe. So it was a real class angle to the way that it, that it worked. But I wouldn't call smallpox um, something that, that was that, that was a small outbreak of uh, 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 in, in terms of epidemics, nor polio, in fact. Um, I mean, to, you know, almost two and a half thousand kids die in one city in 1916, New York. So, no, not not small. They're not small, but certainly you can mutate into into milder uh, versions of the disease, forms of the disease. We, we see that happen quite a lot, but there's no guarantee it will be milder. Mutations can also go the other way. Great. Do you can you tell us about parallels and how the media handled the public information um, and the PR campaigns? between the pandemic since the, the early 19th century to today? Absolutely. Well, of course, the press is a very different beast today um, and you know, it can do things more quickly. Um, it can get things out there or, or more quickly than the rest of it. But I think it would be fair to say that the, the, the kind of modern press as we understand it is very much a phenomenon that's developing in the, in, in the early 20th century. The press really changes um, early in the 20th century. That, of course, has to do with the fact that many more people are literate, right? You've got more people reading. You're going to have to produce a different kind of press for people who are not, whose, whose um, reading skills are not as, as um, high, as it were, as those who had been your readership in the, in, in the 20th century. Yeah, I'm sorry, in the 19th century. So 20th century um, newspaper readership, press readership is very, very different. And what that means is you get um, a press 
that is um, appealing to a much broader audience. So it's it's oversimplifying things. You see a lot more sensationalism in the way that things are reported, all of those kinds of things. And so what we see is a much more sensational press by the beginning of the 20th century whipping things up. Um, and that's very much the case in the kind of press that we see in the United States, in the UK, um, across Europe, um, appealing to a different audience and realizing that sensationalism also sells newspapers, right? So what you see in an earlier period and what you see in the 20th century are really very different. And I would say that what we have today um, is is sort of historically connected to the early 20th century much more than to the the 19th century. Press. It's beginning in the late 19th century as uh, as literacy increases, but it's not there yet. Um, in in an earlier period, it would have been uh, a much more restricted press. It would have been a much more sober press in that respect. Um, it also would have been much pickier in some ways about what it reported. Um, the press in the, in the in the say certainly in Britain in, in the middle of the 19th century was much more kind of an establishment uh, press. It was much more connected to those who were in power and in the government, and that starts to run away, I think, by the early 20th century when you start to see um, the the profit motive really uh, become hugely important because you can just you know sell a lot more newspapers. Um, and sex and disease were two things that always sold newspapers, right? Anything sensational. Thank you. Um, looking into the crystal ball somewhat, are there historical lessons or examples from the previous pandemics that give encouragement that countries will come together to fight future pandemics? And how do you perceive that global cooperation or lack thereof um, playing out thus far with the COVID-19 pandemic? It's such an important question, Angie. It really is. Um, I hope that there will be global cooperation. And we've certainly seen some of it, I think, with the development of the vaccine. We're seeing, um, we've also seen, you know, some examples of, of countries, including uh, certainly the UK. I mean, there was a, um, just a couple of days ago, one of the, the, one of the ministers here was saying, oh, we have the best scientists, South scientists are better than the Belgian scientists and the American scientists, which I found rather depressing, I have to say, because surely this should be an international effort. This is a global problem. And the only way we're really going to be able to deal with it is on a global scale. But we've certainly seen cooperation um, of um, pharmaceutical companies and researchers across national boundaries. And I think that's a very good sign. For me, that's a sign of hope in those kinds of ways. Um, but my hope will be that countries will, um, will rather than sort of, you know, grabbing every last vaccine um, unit that they can for their own people, that they will kind of think about the, 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 the global spread and what that means and, and, and act in those ways. I mean, it's been interesting to think about a country like Australia or New Zealand where what they did pro tem, I mean, it was, you know, it's not meant to be permanent and it isn't permanent. In fact, the first, well, I'll come back to that in a second. What they did for a number of, of weeks was to close their borders, um, to shut down the borders so people couldn't come in. But here's the thing, the first international flight arrived in Melbourne, um, Australia today. Um, so they've opened the borders and they're watching very closely to see what will happen. But that first, that first new flight with, you know, with non-Australians on it actually arrived in Melbourne today. So I think that as things start to ease, I suspect a, a global cooperation will, um, will happen. It needs to happen. It needs to happen urgently. It needs to happen at the medical level. It needs to happen at the political level. It needs to happen at the legal level. It needs to happen at the human level. Um, all of these kinds of things. I mean, yeah, that's another takeaway that I that I should have mentioned is that without global cooperation, um, what will happen is that it will last longer. Um, the, the pandemic will simply go on for a longer period because we will manage to to deal with it in one place but it will just come back when people start to travel again um when people start to move around again and it's a very difficult problem it's a very difficult problem i mean some countries have introduced what they're calling um air corridors to let people in from certain um countries that, that they feel have things under control and the australian new zealand uh reaction i think was the most extreme and the most effective it is draconian, there's no question about it. The government has been draconian there, but look at their numbers, look at the low mortality rates there and the high success rates. And, and friends of mine in Australia tell me that basically life is normal. They can go to restaurants, they can go out dancing, they can 
do what they need to do. They can visit their friends, they can be with their family. Their Christmases are going to be a lot nicer than, than those of the rest of us. That sounds so nice. <laughs> um, There's a lesson there, right? Um, do you have any further insight into COVID and humans, human rights violations in Russia and China, um, disparities with the vaccine distributions in these countries? Right. I don't know. That's a really important question. I don't know much about what's going on. And I don't think many of us actually really know much about what's going on in either of those countries. And come back to your press, question about the press. Um, but there, I think there's no question that we will see human rights violations. Um, and they are the same kinds of things, I think, as the kinds of disparities that I talked about, whether it's about race or poverty or you know, or age or all of those kinds of things in which, you know, if if states or um, communities say some lives are worth more than other lives, because essentially that's what that comes back to, right? Then I think we are looking at human rights violations, um, just as we did when Hocker and Binding's work in, you know, from 1920 gets translated into action um, in Germany in, in the 1930s, when they start literally kill off people with disabilities. Um, if we allow that to happen, if we allow people to say that certain lives are more important than other lives, then we will see widespread human rights violations. But it's starting in places like China and Russia, I don't think surprises any of us. They do have um, different kinds of governments. Uh, and I would draw a line, I draw a distinction between the kind of draconian regulations that a country like Australia and New Zealand is putting into place and those that we see in, 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 in these countries of your question. Um, but I do think that we probably need more draconian legislation than we are seeing, but without the, the violations of human rights that I think are a real danger, absolutely. And I would, and again, that's where I would take us back to Nazi Germany. Um, it's an obvious, and some would say a, a, a kind of cheap analogy, but I don't think it is in this case, because um, that, that work that, that becomes so important in the 1930s actually predates, it doesn't just predate the Nazis, it predates you know, Hitler being in prison. It's 1920 when their book comes out, um, and it's during the First World War, you know, even earlier when they are starving psychiatric patients in order to, to feed soldiers. And those kinds of of notions of some lives being more important, some people being allowed to live and others being either actively killed or allowed to die is something that I do think that um, in the current situation, we need to be very careful about. And I, 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 and I would utterly and adamantly oppose these statements made by people like Dan Patrick, Chris Christie and Glenn Beck, adamantly oppose them. I think it's dangerous. I think it's a slippery slope. And I don't want other people to, I don't, I don't want a group of people, some committee deciding that, you know, grandma can die um, and little Johnny can live. Um, thank you. And then in that same vein, you talked a little bit about um, depoliticizing as a, a way to make people more open to taking the vaccine. Can you expand on other ways that would, you know, help more people take advantage of it and also what percentage of buy-in would allow the vaccine to be most effective? Right, well, the percentage of buy-in has got to be at least 70%. 70 to 75% is your minimum um, buy-in if the vaccine is good. And even then, you know, it, obviously the higher the better. But 60%, which is what the, the last poll I saw, which was yesterday, will cut it, will even begin to cut it. So that's quite important. In terms of depoliticization, I think it's both, um, if you like, both a structural thing and an individual thing. So, you know, individual politicians, um, and it doesn't matter, I'm not talking about people from any particular place on, on the spectrum, but individual politicians need to think, uh, think communally and collectively rather than about, about their own position in the world and their own position in politics. We've got to stop scoring points. It's got to be about what's good for a community. Um, and so when I say de depoliticization, I suppose what I'm really saying at some level is that we need to understand the social and cultural as well as the biological sort of aspects of this, but we need to understand them in a kind of what am I trying to say, in, in, in an arena of generosity, right? So it's not about me specifically, me the politician or me the patient or me the, you know, I don't mean me, I mean, right, I don't mean you, I mean me, whoever me might be, right? I think we have to stop thinking like that and start thinking more collectively about what we share as humans and what we share as a community and the ways in which we can make that work. And if that means 
wearing a mask, even though it's sticky and hot on a, on a summer's day, that's what it means. And so I think, and, and what's happened is all of these things have become politicized. So mask wearing has become um, an assault on freedom. Um, and getting a vaccination is, um, you know, is an assault on freedom. They're not assaults on freedom. A, they are choices. But what I want to see is, this, I want to see people think about those choices, not in terms of individual rights, but in terms of human rights, to go back to your question about human rights. And I think if we can do that, then I think we, in a sense, take the kind of political sting out of the kinds of social and cultural behaviors and patterns of behavior that I think are really important to understand here. And so the choices that we make should be about what's best for communities, the communities we live in, the communities we travel in, the communities we care about. Great, thank you so much. And we have more wonderful questions, but we have run out of time. Um, so on behalf of the University of Texas College of Liberal Arts Development and Public Affairs teams, we wanna thank you, Dr. Levine, for sharing your valuable time with us.